Okay, so yeah, thank you, Amber, for the introduction. I'm Sam, and I'm here to talk to you all about the past, present, and future of Minnesota's herps. And I'm sure a lot of you are seeing that weird word and wondering, well, what in the world are herps? Um, herps is just a fancy name that scientists call reptiles and amphibians. The word actually comes from the Greek word herpian, which just means to creep. So a while ago, scientists said, oh, these things are all creeping and crawling on the ground. Let's just lump them together and study them together. Um, and so reptiles consist of snakes, lizards, turtles, and crocodiles. Amphibians consist of frogs, salamanders, and Sicilians. Now, Sicilians are probably pretty foreign. Not many people might have heard of them, but they're basically wet snakes, as I like to think of them. But um, they're kind of worm-like. They're this uh, top left animal right here. That's a Sicilian. Um, but they do share a few things in common other than the fact that they just creep and crawl on the ground. Um, the main thing that they share in common is that they're all cold-blooded or ectothermic, meaning that they get a lot of their body heat from the environment around them. So they don't produce um, their own body heat like mammals and birds do. They don't have that insulating layer of hair or feathers like mammals and birds do. Um, they pretty much rely on the environment around them to keep warm. That's why you'll see turtles, for example, basking on a log in the middle of the lake, and so they can soak up all that sun to heat themselves up so they can go out and forage and find mates. Um, and the second thing that most herps have in common is that almost all of them lay eggs. So some of them do give live birth. Um, garter snakes, for example, really common Minnesota species, um, they'll give live birth as well as a few species of toads. So almost all of them lay eggs, but not all. Um, but there are quite a few things that make these groups different um, from one another. So reptiles and amphibians split from each other like 350 million years ago. So they've had a lot of time to differentiate and there are quite a few differences. So the main thing that's easy to notice is their skin. Uh, reptiles have this rough scaly skin, whereas amphibians have this slimy smooth skin. And a really cool thing about amphibian skin is that they can actually um, use that mucus layer and they can use it to breathe. So they can breathe through their skin, and that's how amphibians will spend a long time underwater. Um, they're doing gas exchange on their skin the same way that we do our gas exchange to breathe um, in our lungs. So keeping that moist outer layer on their skin is really important for their survival. The second thing is their eggs. So reptile eggs generally have like a thick leathery shell, whereas amphibians lay these big um, clusters of gelatinous eggs. And a lot of the times they will be in the water. Um, sometimes they're on land in really moist places. Um, but the eggs that they lay are very different. And one last thing is their life history. So amphibians and reptiles have really different life histories. Um, baby amphibians, for example, when they come out of their eggs, oftentimes look nothing like the adults. So think about frogs. A tadpole looks nothing like an adult frog. They have to go through metamorphosis the same way that a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. Um, whereas baby reptiles, when they pop out of their shells, if you want to look at that little uh, turtle right there, it looks exactly like an adult turtle. It's just smaller. And we do have quite a bit of diversity from both of these groups in Minnesota, more than I think a lot of people appreciate. So we actually have 14 species of frogs in Minnesota. Um, this is a good time to point out that toads are frogs, frogs are toads. Um, they're all cousins. Um, so we have 14 species of those. Um, and then we have seven species of salamander in Minnesota as well, which is pretty good. Um, but we don't have any Sicilians, unfortunately. But 21 amphibian species in Minnesota. And then we have quite a few reptile species. Um, so we have three lizard species. They're usually these skinks that are found um, primarily in prairie type habitats, but they can be found all over. Um, and then we've got nine species of turtles. Lots of turtles, we've got the smooth, the smooth and spiny soft shell. You've got all sorts of map turtles. Um, painted turtles are probably the most common one or snapping turtles. Those are probably our most common too. And you can see those um, in lakes and streams all over the place. And then we have 17 species of snakes. So this is by far our most diverse group in Minnesota. Um, we've got things like the tiny little red bellied snake, which is gonna be oftentimes like the length of your finger. And then we have things like bull snakes that can reach up to eight feet long. So we have some pretty big snakes in Minnesota, and these are mostly found in uh, prairie and grassland regions. Um, but what we have now isn't necessarily what we've always had. Um, 
so as people kind of came in and settled, um, we affected the way that species can survive. We altered the landscape a lot and we have lost a few species. Um, so some of them have gone extinct in Minnesota, but thankfully these species are still found in other parts of their range. So when something goes extinct in one part of their range, but not totally extinct, we call that extirpation. And we have extirpated a couple of species in Minnesota. Um, the main one being the Massasauga rattlesnake. So these haven't been seen in Minnesota since 1984. But interestingly enough, if you go literally straight across the river, um, you can find them all over the place. So maybe uh, they're just really big Packard spans or something. They, they're fine living in Wisconsin, but they really um, are gone in Minnesota, have not been observed in 30 years. Um, and the Blanchard's cricket frog is another one, although this is kind of an asterisk because we did lose them for you know a decade or so, a little more, or we thought we did. And then in 1998, we rediscovered a really small population down by the airport actually, which has between five and 20 breeding males. And then in the 2000s, we found another small population near Winona. So um, these were lost, but they're still actually barely clinging on in the state. Um, and we've also lost you know, a bunch of populations, places where we used to see a lot of these species, we no longer can find them but it's not all doom and gloom. We've actually found a few species in the last 30 years that we didn't know about before. Um, two salamander species actually. Um, so we have the four-toed salamanders, which were discovered in 1995. And we also have the spotted salamander, which was discovered in 2001 for the first time. So part of this could just be that we were better about going out and doing surveys. Um, but it could also be that they are new arrivals to the state. They might have migrated. They might have been introduced by someone, or we just miss them for you know hundreds and hundreds of years. But we have a couple species that have been recorded here for the first time, which is great. And we want to think about what is causing these changes to species and where we find them in Minnesota. Why are we not finding things where they used to be? Why are we now finding things where they weren't? The main driver of this is habitat loss. Um, so the human population is expanding like crazy. We have to keep making agricultural fields. And it turns out um, a lot of these wetlands and a lot of the prairies make really, really good soil for planting crops. Um, but the downside of that, when you drain these wetlands, when you convert prairies and grasslands to agriculture, you ruin a lot of the habitat that these reptiles and amphibians in particular need to survive. So snakes, grassland species, turtles and frogs really need those ponds. When you get rid of those, they don't have anywhere to live. There are also a lot more direct human impacts. So things like building roads, a lot of things will strike, like car strikes are really bad for primarily amphibians and turtles. Um, things that, you know, birds can be fine, but these guys have to crawl all over the place. And there have actually been studies that show that people will go out of their way to swerve to the side of the road and hit snakes that are basking there trying to soak the sun. So please don't swerve out of your way to hit snakes. Uh, snakes are pretty much all harmless. There's only one venomous species in Minnesota, um, the timber rattlesnake, and there hasn't been anyone killed by one of those probably ever. You really have to go out of your way to make one of those mad. So please don't hit snakes with your car. They really pose no threat to humans. Um, they're great. And then the second thing is pesticides. Um, so the application of pesticides widely kills insects, which pretty much all of these species eat. And if there's nothing for them to eat, it's pretty tough to live. Um, in addition to that, when pesticides get into the water, think about those amphibians, you know, they're soaking up all sorts of things through that moist skin of theirs. Um, it can cause some pretty bad effects in those animals. And then more of an unknown is climate change. So we know that generally things are getting warmer. Specifically here, things have been getting warmer and wetter, and they're going to continue to probably get warmer and wetter in the future. But it might not necessarily be the worst thing in the world for species, especially that are ectothermic, if things were to get warmer. But we know that climate change is going to strongly impact where things can live. So like I said, these things are ectotherms, right? They rely on the environment to get their body heat. Changes in temperature can dramatically alter whether or not they can persist in a given geographic region. So just think about it. If you're a frog, when you're hanging out during the day, soaking up the sun, you like it to be maybe 70 degrees. But if it gets a little bit warmer, let's say averaging 80 degrees during a certain time of the year, you might end up with some dead frogs that can't handle the heat. Um, 
And so what a lot of researchers, myself included, and a lot of other people at the University of Minnesota and everywhere are trying to do is try and predict how climate change might impact these herb species. Is it going to be bad? Are we going to see a lot of, you know, dead frogs or could it make Minnesota more hospitable to these species? And so the first step in doing this is getting environmental data. So here we have a map that shows just what the temperature is during the uh, wettest part of the year. So in Minnesota, kind of right up here, you can see that the temperature during the average or the wettest part of the year kind of ranges between 25 and 18 degrees Celsius. And once we have this environmental data, we have this for all sorts of variables, right? So interactions between precipitation and temperature, we take all of those and then we add occurrence records, which is basically just observations of these species and where we know they exist. And as researchers, this is a great chance to utilize community science. So people will go out and they'll see a garter snake and they'll say, upload it to a map like, or an app like HurtMapper or iNaturalist and say, I found this garter snake, I found it here. And then we can download those records and use them to figure things out. In addition to these great resources, we also have museum collections. So this is where things like the Bell Museum are actually really useful. We have, you know, records from like the 1800s um, of different snakes, frogs and things all over the country, all over the globe. And we can use that to also figure out where they have been and where they are now. And so we take, you know, these occurrence records and we take the environmental data and we look for associations between the environment and where things are found. And so we basically do some fancy math and we take all of that and we use it to in those associations to figure out um, where the climate can support these species essentially. And so we project it into an area like Minnesota and this green area shows basically where we would expect the climate to be suitable for this species. And what's cool about this is we can take those associations and we actually have projections for what the climate is going to be like in the future. And we can take those future climate conditions, take the same associations that we have now between climate and these species and build those same um, suitability models for the future. So here you can see that the green areas are in kind of different geographic locations. And the real question is um, how much more or less of that suitable climate is there going to be in our state? And to think about this, we're gonna go through a few highlighted species. So we've got the Blanding's turtle, we've got the Plains hognose snake, we've got the mink frog and the tiger salamander. So we're really trying to cover our bases biologically. We're covering different groups, two reptiles, two amphibians to see maybe if this can give us some information about how they might respond to climate change in the state. So we'll start with the Blanding's turtle. A little background biology here. They're found pretty much all over the eastern part of the state from north to south. And their habitat are these wetlands with adjacent sandy upland areas. And this kind of makes them a conservation challenge because you can't just focus on wetlands. You can't just focus on, you know, conserving prairies. You have to do both and they have to be right next to each other because these turtles spend most of their life just hanging out in the pond, you know, eating, looking for mates, overwintering. But at some point during the year, they make this migration across roads, across all sorts of things into the prairie, and then they lay their eggs there. And then those babies in turn have to make the same trip back into the wetland that the parents made to go lay the eggs. Um, so you have to conserve all parts of this habitat and maintain that connectivity. Um, and then for food, they're eating all sorts of things. They eat frogs, they eat crayfish, uh, insects, and more. So pretty omnivorous, uh, pretty generalist diets, but a pretty big conservation concern. Um, but the good news for these guys is that even though they are actually federally listed, um, the climate is actually looking pretty good for them. So as you can see here, we go from 2020, 2050 to 2070. And you see these green patches are actually expanding. And it's actually like a tenfold increase in the amount of available habitat for these species or amount of suitable climate. Um, so if you're a Blanding's turtle and you're hanging out in Minnesota, you're gonna be feeling pretty good about the prospect of a warmer state. And now we'll move on to the Plains hognose. Uh, these guys get their name from that adorable little upturned nose 
and they actually kind of use it like a shovel to burrow down into the ground into that really loose sandy soil that they like. Um, these guys are not as widespread as the blanding turtles, but um, that's primarily because they're dependent on these dry prairies and oak savanna. So they're more common in the western part of the state. And the cool thing about these is that they have this fun symbiotic relationship with pocket gophers where they'll use their burrows um, to get down below the frost line in the winter to survive. Um, so, right, it gets pretty cold here. We can barely survive. They've got to find cool ways to survive. And this species does it by uh, using these gopher burrows. And these guys are eating all sorts of things, primarily um, small vertebrates, so little shrews, voles, uh, mice, as well as eggs of other snakes, of other reptiles and birds. And this is another species that actually seems to be well suited for the future climate. Uh, so as things get warmer, maybe a little bit wetter, um, climate should be good for this species as well. Uh, an increase of 44%, 34%, so not as crazy as the Blanding's turtle, but it's looking pretty good for these guys as well. So the reptiles seem to be pretty well off actually under these climate change scenarios that we explored. And now we'll move on to amphibians. So things that are more dependent on precipitation, but still temperature is really important. And so we're gonna talk about the tiger salamander, which is one of um, probably the most common salamander we have in the state. Um, they live in these vernal pools, ponds, and slow moving streams. Vernal pools are just um, bodies of water that can dry up over the course of the year. They're not permanent standing bodies. Um, but these guys are found all over the state, pretty much everywhere except for like the Iron Range in the North Shore. So they're really widespread. Uh, they're really funny looking with those little faces. Um, to survive the winters, they burrow below the frost line, kind of like the hog noses do. And they eat all sorts of invertebrates, maybe bugs, uh, worms, things like that. And once again, we have another species that is projected to see an increase in climate suitability across the state. So 2020, 2050, 2070, we see that green area increasing once again. And our last species that we're gonna talk about, another amphibian is the mink frog. Um, so the mink frog, they are actually primarily found in Northern Minnesota. This is actually pretty much the Southern edge of their range. So Minnesota is pretty much um, as warm as this species can tolerate, which is kind of interesting. Usually you think about Minnesota as being way too cold, but for these guys, it's almost a little too hot. Um, they like these permanent lakes and ponds um, and they are really big fans of lily pads. So if you're up North and you see a frog on a lily pad, there's a really good chance that it's a mink frog. They're always found there, um, just chomping on different invertebrates, different flies and things like that. So the classic picture of frog sitting on a lily pad, that is these guys. And this is the only species that we looked at of the four that is actually projected to see a decrease in climate suitability across the state. Um, so if you look, you see those big green areas kind of decreasing a little bit through time. And once again, that's because probably we can theorize that it's because this is as far south as they go. So it makes sense. This is already kind of as warm as they can handle. If it gets warmer, um, that's not great for them. So our takeaways here, after looking at all of these niche models that we've created, um, looked into the future, it seems like for most of our herb species that the climate conditions are gonna be just as good as they are now, if not better. Really the only reason we might wanna be concerned is for any of those species that have a Southern range limit in Minnesota, because as I just said, it's already as warm as they like it. They don't want it to be warmer. So given that the climate probably isn't gonna be a huge threat, we should focus on the main threats that we've already looked at, the things that we know historically have led to declines in population, uh, which are you know, losing habitat. So if we can preserve and expand the existing habitat for these species, they should be in pretty good shape. Um, and you might be wondering, what can you do about this? What can you do to help herps? And thankfully, there are a lot of things you can do. So you can limit or eliminate your use of pesticides. Like I said, things need to eat to live. And if you're killing all of their food, it's gonna to be tough for these herps to live. Um, so trying to limit or eliminate the use of those is great. Another thing you can do is plant native water plants to increase the habitat quality. Um, it makes more home for bugs. It may, gives frogs and things some extra cover when they're underwater. So that's generally great news. Um, you can create a pond like the one pictured here. This is just a pretty simple backyard pond setup. 
there's all sorts of like YouTube tutorials and things on how to make one. It's definitely a, an if you build it, they will come situation. Um, when there's water, you'll get all sorts of frogs coming in. Um, birds also love it if you're into bird watching. So making a pond is a really way, good way to add some habitat and help these guys out. Finally, just keep your eyes on the road and drive safe. Um, like we said, don't run over snakes. They're really good animals, despite the bad rep that they get. Turtles especially. Amber actually, who uh, is kind of leading this today, she keeps a shovel in her car to help turtles across the road. So if you want to have your own turtle shovel to help them across the road, um, that's definitely a great idea and a great way to help them out and reduce these uh, road fatalities. And finally, uh, being a responsible pet owner is really important. Um, I have a dog. I like to let him run around. But if you're in a natural area, don't let your dog go and disturb nests. They'll dig up nests all the time for turtles and things like that. Cats are especially bad. Um, keep your cats inside. Uh, cats are like the number one killer of wildlife in the United States. So if you can be responsible, keep your pets indoors, it's really going to help out um, these small herps as well as a lot of birds too. And the last thing that is really useful is participating in community science. So if you're out on a hike and you see a snake or something and you want to know what it is, you can upload it to those apps that we talked about earlier and people will actually help you identify them. So like the Minnesota State Herpetologist Jeff LeClaire is on there um, telling people what they're seeing, what turtles they're seeing, what frogs they're seeing. So if you have questions about it, you can upload it to there. Or even if you know what you're seeing, it's really useful for uh, people like me who are trying to figure out how climate change is going to impact these species distributions um, in doing their research. So if you can go out and be a scientist, um, that's really helpful for thinking about the future of these animals. And finally, um, I'm going to make the plug once again, just to come into the Bell Museum and see these animals for yourself. In the touch and see room, they have plenty of toads. Um, snakes and things like that that you can actually handle for yourself and just see how cool they are in person. And there's really only like a 50% chance that a toad pees on you. So there's like no risk involved. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you so much, Sam, for, for sharing all of that information about uh, Minnesota's amphibians and reptiles. Um, one of the first questions that came in from the audience is, um, is from Tally, and Tally um, is reporting that they have a video of a turtle laying eggs in uh, their daughter's garden in Edina just a couple of days ago. They're trying to identify it. They suspect it's a painted turtle, but they can't see much orange on it. And they're wondering uh, what are resources for, for all of us to be able to identify these species in the field and to be able to learn more about them? Yeah, so the Minnesota DNR's website is actually really, really useful. They have information about things like the habitat, where you can find them, ID tips. So I will definitely say check out that website. There are really good field guides out there, but um, iNaturalist especially is useful. I don't know plants. <laughs> so if I see a new plant in my garden, for example, I'll take a picture of it, I put it on the app, and it actually gives you recommendations based on the picture. And so I'm sure iNaturalist works the same way with herps. Um, but like I said, there are people who will go on there, people who um, know these animals and can help you identify them. So people will go through and help you. So I would recommend iNaturalist, Herp Mapper. Um, but if you really want to do it yourself, there are some pretty good resources online. Yeah, and, and I went ahead and linked iNaturalist in the comments, and I'll go ahead and add her mapper here as well. Um, mm -hmm. You talked quite a bit about these citizen science projects and the role that they play in your work. You know, with, without those databases, how complicated would this research be? It'd be a lot harder. Um, so we actually, when we started out doing this, um, this little presentation and the research behind it, we we're like, oh, we can just use uh, museum collections. But for a lot of these species, especially things that are protected, like the cricket frogs or the Blanding's turtles, um, they have a responsibility to actually keep those records private from people who would try to go and take them for the pet trade and things like that. Um, but yeah, the community science stuff makes it so much better. The more data points you have, it actually makes the models a lot more accurate too. And you can only get so many records um, for the present day from museums. Most of them are historic data which like I said earlier, is really nice for knowing where things were. But if we wanna know where things are now and we're trying to build these current models, um, having, yeah, 
these apps and this community science data is so useful. So Minnesota being obviously a, a water rich state um, and having a lot of those different ecosystems, does that does that put Minnesota in a different category in terms of diversity and number of species of, of herps? Um, I mean, obviously, in comparison to a place like Arizona, it's probably quite different. Um, is, is this kind of a unique e area and ecosystem for for those populations? Yeah, you know, Minnesota is kind of unique in that we have you know, the classic, we have three different biomes sort of, we have that northern coniferous forest, we have the deciduous forest, we have the prairies. So there's kind of lots of room all over the state for a lot of things, but those winters are really kind of what limits our biodiversity right now. So if you go to, to a place like Arizona, they actually probably have more species for sure of reptiles, maybe not amphibians, um, maybe more turtles, but reptiles really like the warm, dry places, whereas amphibians need water, but yeah, the winters are just so brutal for so many species that that's kind of what limits us in our species diversity. But there are animals that can cope with it. You know, you've got frogs that basically have antifreeze running through their veins to not freeze up in the winter. Um, you know, things taking advantage of gopher burrows to get below the frost line. So it's possible, but it's just really hard for these animals to survive the winters. No, thank you for that. I, I really appreciate that. That's one of the most common questions we get about um, about the animals in particular in the touch and see room is in the wild, what do they do in the winter? Because yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's very hidden from us. Um, the next question comes in from Stacy, and, and I think Stacy's referring to um, a part in your presentation where um, Stacy's wondering if there are any herb species um, in addition to the one you discussed north of us in Canada whose uh, far south range is near our shared border and that could pot potentially extend into Minnesota with climate change. Yeah, I don't have extensive knowledge of these ranges, unfortunately, as most of the ones that I looked up for this talk. Um, but off the top of my head, I think the northern map turtle might be a similar species. Um, you could probably point to the breeding ranges of like a bunch of birds, for example. Um, Minnesota is kind of the southern limit of their breeding range, but that's a whole different thing. Um, but yeah, herp wise, I think there aren't that many, maybe one or two others, but for the most part, it's pretty much, this is usually the northern limit. So we're obviously into a good season to be able to kind of get outdoors and start looking for these things around us. Um, you know, for those of us that are in, in the metro area, do you have any particular places that are your favorites to kind of go out and, and search for these creatures? Yeah, so a really good spot is the Minnesota Valley Wildlife Refuge. Um, it's really well known for being like a birding spot, but it's got a lot of good herbs there as well. You've got these nice river banks where you can see the soft shell turtles, which are cool. Um, there's a lot of ponds and things like that as well for frogs. So, and that's actually where we found those Blanchard's cricket frogs back in 1998. Someone was walking around down there and was like, yeah, I don't recognize this call and then uh, let the DNR know. Um, so that's, that's a really good spot. But then pretty much any of the big regional parks um, in St. Paul, things like Crosby Farm, um, I'm from Anoka, Minnesota, so Bunker Hills was um, a place where I could always see things. Like I've seen massive bull snakes there. But yeah, pretty much any of your big regional parks, anywhere with good access to water, um, you can hear frogs calling all over the place. I mean, even if you're on like a golf course, which has crazy fertilizer usage, there are still frogs there. So if, you're, if you want to look for frogs, pretty much any body of water. Although, a lot of them are already done calling for the year, but there's still plenty of things. The toads are out like crazy now. Yeah, in addition, I, I would encourage people to stop by the Bell Museum's learning landscape. Even when the museum's closed, you can check out the outdoor learning landscape. And yes, we hear frogs calling and toads hopping and um, there's lots of things. And even in that small little space next to the museum to see. So before we leave today, Sam, I, I, have, I have the one question that's always the hardest question, I think, for researchers to answer, because obviously you've studied herbs throughout, throughout the country in a lot of different places. Do you have a favorite? <laughs> um, if I had to pick one, I'd probably say the Blanding's turtle. 
I, I just really like those guys. I was, when I was at St. Olaf doing my undergrad, we were at Weaver Dunes, which is like the largest blanding turtle population in the country. I mean, you can see like the little signs, they have signs on the road, which say like, yeah, don't run over these guys. Um, but they're cute and they're charismatic. So if I had to pick one, I'd say the Blanding's turtle. Thank you. Thanks for taking a stance on that. Sometimes it's really hard for people to decide. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much, Sam, for walking us through all the reptiles and amphibians and that we can find Minnesota and how climate change